Perfect. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back for our second class with Anthony Vondermolt today. All right, so today is going to be our second webinar that we've done remotely in which the speaker is off-site. And we're doing this in response to the coronavirus and uh, trying to keep everyone safe and practicing social distancing. So coronavirus here in L.A., it's... Um, a little crazy right now. There's a lot of people rushing to the stores. I just passed by Costco this morning at 8 a.m. and there's a line out the door. Costco doesn't open until I believe 10 a.m. I know they open on the weekdays at 10 a.m. so I'm guessing today too. And it's raining. It's uh, lightly raining. So people are waiting outside to get water, toilet paper. I don't know. Who knows what. But um, just to share a laugh with you guys, last night I was driving home and uh, I do pass by a strip club and I want to let you know that the strip club parking lot is completely full. So I don't know what kind of toilet paper they have there, but there's a lot of people there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So now that we have a good laugh for today, let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. Today's class topic is on stabilizing joints through ligament ligamentous Prolo Acupuncture. My name is Donna Chow and I will be your host and moderator for today's event. All right, so let's get to know you guys a little bit. How many of you have heard of Prolo Acupuncture? Type ACU, ACU in the chat room if you have. Okay, looks like we have a, it looks like it's more 50-50 now. More on the no side. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay, more on the no side. So good. I'm so glad you guys are here today. And then we also want to know how many of you were here for yesterday's class. If you were, please type trigger in the chat room. Yesterday's topic was on trigger point acupuncture. Okay, great. A lot of people. All right, so if you were not here yesterday, uh, today's class, we, we talked about how Anthony will be doing, will be teaching the class from his home. So it's a little bit different than how we normally do it. We normally have the speaker come to our seminar studio and then we record it. That way it just, uh, we want to stabilize all the technology and make sure everything is streaming. But Anthony's connection yesterday was perfect and he did great demonstrations, so we expect the same results today. Okay, so on behalf of eLotus, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for choosing Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine as your CEU provider. We have been hosting educational courses here for over 20 years and we are proud to be your trusted source for CEU premium content. I'd also like to take this time to thank Evergreen Herbs as well as our customers. Because of you, we are able to host special promotional events and freebies throughout the year. When you choose Evergreen as your provider, you're also choosing to invest in the advancement of TCM. Thank you so much for being, for being part of such a great collective. Helping each other is definitely a domino effect and the key to succeeding together. Now before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. We are scheduled to end at 6 p.m. Pacific time today. Lunch is 1 to 2 p.m. and we'll have two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. All right, so now let me give you a quick overview of our webinar room. To the right of the video feed, you will find the PowerPoint for today's class. And a copy of these slides can be found in a PDF version from the course access page. Under the video feed, you will find the chat room. And here, you are welcome to connect with your colleagues who are also attending today's class live. For any side ch chatter, feel free to private chat. You can do this by clicking on the menu icon at the top right-hand corner of the chat room. The menu icon looks like a bunch of horizontal lines with an upside down triangle. If you have any questions regarding your account or technical issues, please feel free to start a private chat with the host. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it directly into the chat room. He'll be able to see it while presenting if he is at the camera. If he's doing a demo, then he won't be looking at the, at the screen. So some people, when he's looking away from the camera, they have asked why he hasn't answered his question, answered the question, and it's because he's not looking at the screen. Um, and you'll see him looking at the screen because he'll be looking at you. <laughs> Please do keep your questions related to the topic he is currently presenting. 
All right, let's get started with today's class on stabilizing joints through ligamentous proloacupuncture with Anthony Vondermal. Anthony specializes in sports, orthopedic, and neuromuscular neuromusculoskeletal injuries and pain conditions. He has over 15 years of clinical experience as a sports massage therapist, physical therapist, aid, and athletic training assistant, and is also a licensed acupuncturist in multidisciplinary clinics, including Spine Med Associates and the Prime Pain Institute. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Anthony. And Anthony, let's do one quick test, uh, one sound test before we begin. Very good. Welcome, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, well, thank you very much, Donna, uh, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. And I really want to thank eLotus for, um, for sp continuing to sponsor this class um, despite these rapidly changing and challenging circumstances. And uh, give a little credit to eLotus for being the first acupuncture educational organization that I heard taking some, some vigorous action to um, help prevent the transmission of the COVID, um, the coronavirus. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were in, visiting family in Israel <clears throat> um, and looking forward to this, um, to you know, flying down to LA to E Lotus's studio for this um, uh, webinar. And I got an email from Donna saying, we are canceling the in-person part of it because of the coronavirus fears. And so they were ahead of the curve and exhibiting some real leadership on this, and I, I think they deserve credit for that uh, rapid pivoting to the new reality that we're going to be living with for a little while. For those of you that uh, watch this webinar five or ten years from now, my hope is that you go, what? What was it? coronavirus? I don't. I never heard anything about that. I don't remember anything about that. But chances are this seems to be a, uh, a major event that's going to have some profound and lasting impacts on our society. and. Um, uh, so our uh, midweek this last week, we, we decided that, that even I would stay home, that I would not fly down to City of Industry. And so welcome to my living room, our living room. And I also really want to thank my wife, Tamara Brown, who's here with us today uh, for, for helping set up the living room on very short notice and making it accessible to all of you as a, as a clinic and video studio all at once. Uh, she's going to be serving as camera person and demonstration patient today. Um, so thank you very much, Tamara. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and uh, here, this is Tamara. Hi. <laughs> and, um, and also, I really want to thank um, a group of students and, and colleagues of mine in the, um, the Doctorate of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine program, in which I'm both a student and a teacher uh, at the Academy of Chinese Culture and Health Sciences in Oakland. Uh, those of you who were logged in yesterday for the myofascial trigger point, um, webinar, uh, got to see some of them. A, a couple of them will be back today as demonstration patients, uh, and a couple of others will be coming in. And um, and uh, they they on, on short notice volunteered their time uh, when they could be out doing uh, you know their their panic shopping and uh, getting ready for a, a period of time where we're all going to be hunkering down and self isolating. Um, so thanks in, in advance to all of them, and, and I'll be introducing them as they come in the door. Um, so I had prepared this, uh, this slideshow, obviously, uh, in a sort of logical sequential order, um, assuming, you know, you know, weeks and months ago that we would be doing this uh, at the City of Industry studios of eLotus with a, a live audience there, out of whom I could select people that had specific conditions that were appropriate to the topic I was going to teach. Um, we're having to adapt that a little bit here. Um, I do have the, the, the students uh, and colleagues of mine who are going to be coming by today um, do have some useful conditions that will be appropriate for me to, to teach and demonstrate. But um, in respect for their time and their need to spend time with their families or uh, on their own, you know, getting ready for this, um, I just said, come when you can, tell me what it is that you'd like me to treat, and I will make it into a, an educational presentation for you. So uh, I'm going to ask you all to bear with me because it'll be a little bit jumpier than you, than it might otherwise be. I'm going to all the information is there in the slideshow. Don't worry, you have access to that. Um, you will be able to scroll through and look at slides. Even if I jump from the ankle slide to a demonstration person's shoulder, um, the information is all there. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that's just a little bit about the logistics today. Um, if you have questions about which slide I'm on, unfortunately, the Adobe Connect app does not display the number of the slides, so I can't tell you exactly which number 
Um, but I will try, I'll do my best to go through them in a sequential fashion so that you don't um, find yourself lost. And yesterday students were great about helping each other out by just saying, oh, he's on this slide here now. And, and uh, so um, please keep that up, everyone. Okay. So um, I see that quite a few of you were here yesterday. Um, some of you weren't. Um, I see some familiar names in the, in the chat room, um, colleagues, former students, now colleagues, uh, friends of mine, and some of you whom I have yet to get the, the pleasure to know. But I want to welcome you all and thank you for being here. And uh, today's topic of stabilizing joints through ligamentous proloacupuncture. Um, I did see some of you are familiar with this terminology, and many of you not. And that's to be expected because this is not as well known or widespread, uh, I believe, a, uh, a technique of using needles as yesterday's topic, myofascial trigger point needling, or as other forms of acupuncture. However, um, it is really my, my go-to, my number one for treating um, neuromuscular skeletal pain. It, is, is, it has become an essential and central tool of my clinical practice. Um, and uh, I'll hope to demonstrate and explain why in a variety of ways throughout the course of the day. Um, w in regards to yesterday's class, this is Today we're going to be treating the yin aspect of the muscular skeletal system. Yesterday we were treating the yang aspect, the muscles, the dynamic um, uh, muscles that, that make our bodies move. But in order for them to function effectively, they have to have a stable yin uh, platform off of which to lever. The, the bones have to be joined uh, effectively and appropriately, to, appropriately together by connective tissue, by ligaments, joint capsules, uh, and some of those structures contain uh, some of those joints contain intraarticular structures like menisci and discs and so on. Um, and um, one of my little jokes about this topic is that we're, this is the missing link. Uh, literally, these are uh, uh, ligaments link bone to bone. Um, and when they are missing or stretched out or torn or destabilized, that creates problems up and down the biomechanical chain or the meridian in, in Chinese medical terms. Um, and it's also the missing link in our education. How many of you remember spending any time on the subject of ligaments in your undergraduate anatomy class? I took anatomy classes. I took undergraduate anatomy three times, uh, and I think maybe I heard a reference once or twice to the anterior cruciate ligament. And that one we all know because, you know, sports um, athletes sprain the ACL all the time. And beyond that, I don't think we heard anything about ligaments. And yet they're extremely important. Um, uh, living structures that we can treat very effectively, very rapidly, in a very lasting way through um, proloacupuncture. So what does this term proloacupuncture mean? It's shorthand for proliferative um, because it uh, appropriately used uh, this acupuncture technique causes cell growth and proliferation. But the term proliferative therapy or, or, prolo or uh, prolotherapy does not come out of our traditions of Chinese medicine. This is a contemporary uh, technique that was pioneered primarily by sports uh, physicians who need rapid results with athletes and also used extensively by some osteopaths and naturopaths primarily and some rather non-mainstream phys uh, physicians. This is not a mainstream um, uh, physician technique. Um, it is generally not covered by insurance. It has not been extensively researched the way some other techniques have. Um, and yet it is very effective and some of you may have heard the terms platelet-rich plasma injection, um, which is kind of a step up from prolotherapy, where they're actually injecting uh, the patient's own plasma back into a joint. Prolotherapy by itself is usually just injecting an irritant solution like sugar water or salt water. But we can do much the same with acupuncture needles without injecting anything. And it's controversial within the field about how much the injected substance makes a difference versus simply the mechanical effect of the needle on the tissue. And I've had prolotherapy, I've, uh, and I've had proloacupuncture. I've done it to myself, uh, and I've had it done to me. Um, and they both work really well. Uh, and I'll talk about the relationship between prolotherapy and proloacupuncture more as the class goes on. Okay. Um, so with that, that large introduction here, uh, I'm going to start getting a little bit more into detail. So let's talk about the ligaments. So there is a term for ligaments in Chinese. It's run dai. Uh, Pardon my accent for those of you that speak Chinese far better than I do, which is probably most of you. Um, but ligaments uh, link bones to bones to form joints, right? That's the basics of it. Um, now, there are some ligaments that exist outside of joints, too, and we'll cover a few of those as well. 
but um, they are probably uh, most appropriately considered part of the uh, the Jingjin, uh, which are uh, translated uh, typically in the West as sinew meridians, although I'm going to spend a little time with that. I think that's a bit of a mistranslation. But the Jingjin um, uh, also were a missing link, and I think certainly my master's level education and then many of ours, where most of our time was spent on the Jing Luo, and perhaps we went, spent some time on the eight extras. Um, but the Jingjin kind of got the short shrift, very little discussion, very little time spent on them. And yet they comprise about 80% of the body's weight and about 80%, consume about 80% of its caloric resources. And they're extremely important. If the Jingjin are not functioning well, um, we're in pain, we're sedentary, um, we uh, don't get the blood flow and the neural activity that we should to keep our vital organs healthy, and lots of other things start to break down. So they're very important. Um, so what we do when we needle into ligaments and, and related connective tissue um, is we can accelerate the healing and reduce the chronicity from joint sprains. Uh, we can restabilize a hypermobile joint that might have been sprained a long time ago and restore normal joint tracking and biomechanics, how the joint moves and also how it doesn't move, how it resists forces from outside the body. Okay? Um, we can help to slow and allow for reversal of the joint of joint degeneration that leads eventually to osteoarthrosis. Um, and we can enhance the treatment of injured muscles and nerves that contribute to chronic pain. Okay? So that's why this is a, an important technique. Um, so my goals for, the, uh, for this class is that uh, by the end of it, you'll have a, a good sense of what you, you may have to learn from and gain from studying and practicing ligamentous proloacupuncture. Um, you'll have a sense of history and exam findings that indicate ligamentous proloacupuncture. You know, when would you reach for this technique? When would you use it? Uh, you'll have a, a good sense of some of the safety issues, uh, some of the what I would recommend in terms of further training, um, some side effects and contraindications and cautions that need to be discussed with the patient and how to educate the patient about what you're doing. Um, you'll be familiar with uh, ligamentous proloacupuncture techniques for many of the major and clinically significant joints and ligaments of the body. And you'll be familiar with, with some further methods um, to, uh, to learn about this technique if you, if you find yourself interested and want to go into it further. Um, okay. So here's how I, I came to, to, to discover and use this technique myself in my clinical practice. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I, I graduated from the Five Branches University in California with a master's in traditional Chinese medicine in 2002 and got my license the following year and um, started practicing in my uh, community of Santa Cruz, California and started a clinic there um, and pretty quickly focused uh, very narrowly on sports and orthopedics and neuromuscular skeletal medicine, working often on a referral basis with a lot of physicians in my area and sometimes in their clinics as well. Um, and uh, working a lot with uh, physiatrists uh, and chronic pain management physicians. Um, and my first big educational venture um, after completing my master's degree was the National Board Certification of Acupuncture Orthopedics, taught primarily by Fred Lerner, uh, also Donald Kendall, um, uh, who some of you might remember. And uh, there were an, uh, some physicians who taught in the program. Fred, Dr. Fred Lerner was himself a chiropractor. Um, and uh, that was a great program. It was mostly focused on Western orthopedics, helping those of us who are acupuncturists um, uh, build our skills and communication abilities to work with Western physicians, work in um, multidisciplinary clinics, function within the workers' compensation system. It was a very pragmatic program, um, and, but it, it, it um, didn't add that much directly to my skills of the acupuncture, um, except for a better understanding of neuromusculoskeletal anatomy and injuries. And so after completing that, that excellent program, I decided to do another series in acupuncture orthopedics with Alon Marcus, who some of you may remember, um, longtime practitioner, now retired, um, used to practice in Oakland, California, and just a walking encyclopedia of knowledge about Eastern and Western neuromusculoskeletal medicine and publisher of several books on the topic, which I highly recommend. And I was fortunate enough to spend enough time with Alon to to uh, understand the value of this technique and how to apply it. And it was in one of his classes where he treated um, 
my sacroiliac joint uh, with this technique that really got my attention. I'd had chronic back pain and leg pain for years. It still flares up occasionally, but nothing like it used to. And in, in one five-minute um, treatment where Alon um, um, kind of uh, um, mobilized my sacroiliac joint and then followed up in the sacroiliac joint line with some strong needling into the posterior sacroiliac ligaments, and I sit up off the table, and I felt completely different head to toe. It was the most potent acupuncture treatment I'd ever had in real time. It's just like, bang, five minutes, and my body felt well aligned. The pain was gone. Everything felt comfortable and loose and, and, and yet stable. And my posture was different head to toe. And I was like, wow, there's something here that I, 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 I want more of it myself, and I need to learn more of it. And that, that really beneficial effect lasted for a good week and then slowly began to fade. And with a little follow-up, um, I got some prolo uh, prolotherapy as well from a physician in my home community into the same area. It made a huge difference for me uh, and a lasting difference. And so that was, I think, around 2006. And since that time, I've been practicing this on a regular basis and using it more and more as I understand just how useful it is. Okay. So those are my sources uh, for my material, uh, the clinical material. And um, so th this is a very safe technique. I know that sounds scary, needling into joints. There are a few things that we need to pay extra attention to that I'll, I'll, I'll cover. And this is my, my um, uh, introduction to those issues. Uh, additional training that for safety and for efficacy that may be helpful for you as a traditionally trained um, licensed acupuncturist. So the most important safety issue is just knowing um, the, the neurovascular anatomy around joints, the periarticular neurovascular anatomy. Um, and in many cases, there isn't anything particular to learn here, but there's a few joints, and actually a, a, a couple of them I'm not going to cover today because they're very tricky. The hip joint is the most difficult joint to, to, to treat with. It's very deep in the body and right near the femoral artery. Um, but uh, the shoulder joint is very commonly injured and very important to know how to treat. And we just need to, to know enough of the local anatomy so that we don't accidentally hit the brachial and axillary arteries. Okay. Um, in terms of efficacy, uh, well, also the other thing is, that, that I'll cover is recognizing when you've got a really serious joint injury that needs to be referred out promptly. Okay. So in terms of efficacy, um, uh, depending on your background, depending on which school you went to and which teachers you followed, uh, you may or may not need uh, a little more um, study and knowledge of joint anatomy, joint biomechanics, their planes of motion, how they're supposed to move, how they're not supposed to move, and how they get injured and what happens if they get injured. Um, the, the history that indicates specifically joint dysfunction or joint derangement. These are technical terms that I'll explain in more detail in the class. Um, knowing how to physically examine joint function. In particular, there's a technique that, uh, I'll, I'll be frank, is difficult to teach, even in person um, and certainly online, um, but I'm going to do my best here, which is uh, what we call passive joint play or end field testing, uh, also known as passive range of motion, although we're not really concerned so much with the range here as we are with the, what the end field is like, and I'll, I'll be explaining that in more detail. Okay? Um, but also knowing how to assess active range of motion in a patient's joint, how to do manual strength testing of the muscles that cross that joint. And then the, the easiest one probably for all of us to, to, uh, to quickly incorporate into our practices as acupuncture is joint, li joint line palpation. For that, all you really need is a good anatomy reference and a little bit of practice on yourself uh, and, on your, and repetition on your patients to be able to find the, the, the cracks, the, 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 the gaps between two bones that are spanned by ligaments and held together sometimes by structures like menisci. And, and if you feel overwhelmed by the other material about passive joint play and end field testing or active range of motion or anything like that, don't worry. You can still do an awful lot of good simply by finding the joint line um, and needling into it. Okay? Um, and then finally, um, in order to be effective with this technique, it's really important that you and your patient are on the same page about their goals and their tolerance for uncomfortable needling. Okay? Um, this technique uh, can be quite uncomfortable. Um, it can be not too bad. Um, it, it varies from patient to patient, joint to joint, condition to condition, and practitioner to practitioner, of course. Um, and what we'll spend a fair amount of time on is, is um, this, this essential challenge of matching 
your technique and your style to the patient's pain tolerance and to the patient's goals for treatment. Um, two variables there, their goals and their, and their tolerance. Okay? Um, some patients may be willing to endure an awful lot of discomfort because they have a very specific goal that's very important to them. They want to be able to return to work. They want to be able to resume their athletic activity. They've got a, a marathon coming up. Uh, they, they want to be able to pick up their kids or you know, uh, there's some activity in daily life that they're really inhibited from doing. And they may be willing to endure an awful lot of discomfort um, up front in order to get to their goal. Um, other patients may have, instead of a, an aspirational goal, of, uh, you know, I want to be able to do this, they may have a pain avoidance goal. And those, and those patients, we all know this, no matter what style, if we're using distal acupuncture, whatever, simply avoiding pain and minimizing pain is very, um, it's a difficult goal to meet in a mortal human body. So um, now I do, I do again, I, I match my, my technique to their goals. And if their goal is really to avoid pain, um, this might not be the right technique for them. So I'll, I will be upfront right now. I'll say, um, I would say maybe a third to half of my patients in my clinical practice you know, probably a third, not, not as much as a half, but probably a third, I may use only distal needling. I may use small needles and do, you know, Richard Tan's balance method or TCM acupuncture that I learned at the master's level or use some master dong points. I use a lot of ear points, just about every patient I use ear points on. And, and, um, and those techniques work very well too. For some patients, um, they work great. For some patients, not so much. Um, so what I'm offering here is a complement and alternative to to gentle distal needling if you are finding that you need some, uh, some alternatives. And this, this technique in particular, I have not found distal needling to work terribly effectively for a sprained ACL, MCL, and medial meniscus in the knee or a shoulder that's been dislocated. Um, those, those, when when a, a problem reaches that magnitude of structural disruption, my clinical experience is you need to do something structural and it needs to be done locally. And yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but with appropriate education and appropriate technique, most patients you can work with uh, to get through that and get, get them to where they want to go. Okay. So uh, here's a little self-test for you. Um, tendons and ligaments. My master's level students mix these up all the time and use the terms interchangeably as if they were one thing. Um, are they right? Yes? No? To some degree? What's a ligament? No idea? Um, are they the same as in terms of their, their function, their kinesiology, um, their structure and their gross anatomy, um, their histology, their microanatomy and physiology? No, they're not the same, not at all. Um, they, I mean, they're not completely different. They've got, so here, there is an area of overlap that I'll get to in a moment here. But here's another little self-test for you. How quickly can you name the ligaments um, that are, you know, you've got some hints here from the initials, but um, can you name them and can you describe their attachments and their functions? Do you know what they do? Here's a bunch of you know, uh, connective tissue that is very important to understand and know what to do with in terms of treating the knee. Okay. And somebody said, yes, if you eat pho, you know it's not the same. Ligaments and tendons. Yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely right, Donna. That's one, to, one way to check out. Get, get some beef tendon soup and uh, you'll see that ligaments and tendons are quite different. Okay. Um, so here's something that they have in common is that they are less elastic and have, they have more abrupt failure points than muscles. Okay. This is what's called a, a, a load deformation curve. You can see the slope going up. That's increasing load, increasing stress on the structure. And then you can see at the top it starts to wobble a little bit. And then you get this abrupt failure where, where ligaments and tendons snap um, suddenly. Muscles have a very different load deformation curve where they, they, do, they will fail eventually. Um, but it's a much gent typically a gentler failure. It's the, um, so analogy would be a piece of uh, uh, cloth that starts to fray and starts to, to, to get little micro tears in it and then starts to give way with bigger, progressively bigger tears and then may eventually snap through all the way. That's like a, um, that's a muscle, okay? Ligaments um, are not quite like bones. I mean, bones have the most abrupt failure point of all, but they're closer to bones. They can only be stretched to about 4 to 10 percent of their resting length before abrupt failure occurs. Um, and, and tendons are somewhere in between muscles and ligaments. They are somewhat more elastic, um, but they too can abrupt, abruptly fail. 
Um, okay. So um, I, I'm just going to go through this quite quickly, just as just a review of terminology, so that the rest of the the day, we're you know we're you understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so when we're talking about joint structure and function, we've got both the the yin tissues that are articular, that are part of the joint itself or inside the joint. That includes the bony surfaces that are attachment sites for cartilage gen plates um, and for their muscles that cross the joint, the tendons and ligaments that cross the joint. We have the cartilage end plates themselves, and we also have menisci and discs in some joints that form uh, shock absorbers and help with gliding of joint surfaces. Uh, outside the joint, in most cases, there's a few, there's a couple ligaments that cross right through the center of joints. We already mentioned one, the ACL and its companion ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament. Um, those ligaments go right through the center of the joint, but most ligaments lie outside joints, and some actually are, are, are extra articular ligaments that are not inside a joint at all. Um, but there's ligaments, uh, labrums are like rubber gaskets that hold um, a bone into a socket. Um, the, the hip and shoulder have uh, labrums that are very important for maintaining the stability of those joints. And then there's the capsule, and ligaments and labrums and tendons all can blend into a capsule. A capsule is just a massive connective tissue that holds synovial fluid inside the joint. Okay? And together, the ligaments and the labrums and the capsules limit motion and provide what we would call passive stability to the joint. And the capsules, as I said, also enclose synovial fluid. The yang aspects of the joint are, are outside the joint the transarticular tissues that cross the joint. And we have muscles and tendons. That's, those are the yang aspects. Um, the muscles provide dynamic control and stability. We can uh, consciously, deliberately, you know, lock our knee or lock our elbow or hold our shoulder stable by contracting the muscles that cross that joint. Uh, they cover and protect in warm joints, and they deliver blood. And this is very important. Um, cartilage does not have. Um, uh, its own capillaries. The only way that cartilage is nourished inside a joint is through diffusion through the, the, um, the joint capsule and the synovial fluid of blood that is circulating in the muscles outside the joint. So if people don't use a joint, it deprives it of, of uh, blood, which means no oxygen, no nutrients in the buildup of waste products, and it actually hurts worse. Okay? So uh, yes, if a joint is acutely sprained and unstable and deranged, there may be a, a period of time where it needs to be stabilized um, and not used. But increasingly in physical medicine, it's recognized that the sooner people return to a moderate and appropriate level of activity, um, the, the sooner and faster and better the joint recovers. Okay? And so it's important to explain to your patients about that. Your, your joint's not going to get the nourishment it needs if you don't use it, um, even if it's painful to use it. So, um, we just have to make sure that they're using it in appropriate ways. It doesn't re-injure the joint. Okay. So some some tendons, as I mentioned, blend in with ligaments and joint capsules. An example of this is the uh, that we'll spend some time with today is the proxipital um, bicipital tendon of the long head of the biceps. It blends right into the superior glenoid labrum of the shoulder, and so uh, uh, a biceps tear or a shoulder injury they will affect each other. Um, a shoulder joint injury. Okay, and that's a very common presentation. Um, the uh, distal rotator cuff tendons blend with the glenohumeral joint capsule as well. So um, rotator cuff problems also affect the joint and vice versa. Okay. The distal IT band blends with the lateral collateral ligament of the knee. So those, those are just a few of many examples. So excuse me one moment. <clears throat> um, it doesn't take very long in a cadaver lab to realize how, how um, schematic our anatomy textbooks and apps are that make everything look like they're kind of neatly compartmentalized in different color-coded sections that kind of fit together like uh, you know, complicated, curvaceous Lego. Um, but when we spend any time in a cadaver lab, we realize, oh, everything is just blends one tissue type into the next. It's all kind of stuck together. And of course, that's really what Chinese medicine has always said, is that everything is, is interconnected and, and affects each other. Um, and so I just want to make that point, that these distinctions and these names we give things, um, they're useful, um, and, but they are a little bit arbitrary, too. Uh, and so not to get too hung up on it. Okay. 
So we also have yin and yang types of joints. Our yang joints are our synovial or capsular joints that contain synovial fluid. Um, and the synovial fluid also functions as a shock absorber and a lubricant and helps deliver nutrients. Um, sometimes there are menisci and labrums inside these synovial, these yang joints. The motions of these joints are, are anatomical, under voluntary control. I can decide to, to bend my neck to one side or the other. Um, and, at, and I'm moving the synovial joints of the, um, the, uh, the neck, the little facet joints on either side. I can raise my arm and that big synovial joint, glenohumeral joint here, um, is under voluntary control. Um, and the injuries to these joints are characterized by hypermobility, uh, sprains that cause, that lead to laxity, which make the joint more vulnerable to repeated sprains. It's very common with the shoulder and with the ankle. Somebody sprains it once, then they start, it's just the beginning of a whole cycle of sprains until, and unless they get that joint appropriately treated and restabilized. Eventually, those hypermobile joints will go the opposite way and become hypomobile, um, and, and I'll talk about that progression more. Um, but this is another type of injury to joints as they become hypomobile. The swelling and adhesions and bony hypertrophy start to limit the mobility of the joint. Um, both of these hyper and hypomobility can be uh, present in the same joint, but in different planes of motion in that joint. It can be hypermobile in one direction and hypomobile in another direction. And both problems, hyper and hypomobility, uh, tend to abrade joint surfaces and hasten, hasten wearing out of the cartilage. Okay? So examples of these young synovial joints that are under voluntary control are the glenohumeral or shoulder joint, the elbow, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. Those are the ones we're all most familiar with, probably. Okay. The yin joints are, there's a number of different ways to categorize this in Western anatomy, but uh, usually called syndesmoses or fibrous joints. These are bones that are welded very tightly together by fibrocartilage and ligaments. They don't have a capsule. They don't have joint fluid or synovium. They don't have any intraarticular structures. And the motion is really minimal. Uh, they're supposed to be extremely stable. In fact, the, the ligaments of the posterior sacroiliac joint are, are, are supposed to be so strong that if somebody lands on hard on their pelvis, the pelvis may fracture before those ligaments tear. Um, but nonetheless, there's supposed to be a little bit of motion at that joint. It's, it's minimal motion that's really accessory to other joint motions. The sacroiliac joint has to be able to move just a little bit during gait um, that, is, that is being created by the hip and knee and ankle joints. Okay. But those motions are not anatomical motions. They're not under voluntary control. I can't deliberately say, okay, I'm going to move my sacroiliac joint any better than I can say I'm going to pop my molar out of my jaw. That's another example of a syndesmosis or fibrous joint is what holds the tooth in the jaw. So, uh, and these injuries are characterized primarily by hypermobility. They're supposed to be extremely stable. And any, any increase in motion there, any pathologic increase in motion there can cause a lot of trouble. Um, some of these joints are not crossed by muscles or tendons at all. The sacroiliac joint, the AC joint, the sternoclavicular joint are the three main examples of these joints that are not crossed by any muscles or tendons. They're just bone to bone. Okay. Other examples, the pubic symphysis, the wrist triangular fibrocartilage. Okay. Uh, these are other examples of yin joints or syndesmoses. And then we've got our spinal discs and facets, which kind of combine some of these characteristics. Um, and I think I'm actually going to slip, skip over this slide for now. It's not that important to go into the details, but you can look at it more when we come back to, uh, to, uh, to treating the spine today. Okay. So here's what happens when there's an injury to the yin or the intraarticular tissues. There's a progression here. And it doesn't always proceed in its exact linear form, but this is kind of the general progression. Um, that there's a stretching or tear, tearing of ligaments, capsules, discs, menisci, labrums, etc. And this initiates something called the degenerative cascade. This is Western terminology, but it has a correlate, and I've got a slide I'll show you shortly that shows the correlate in terms of uh, the TCM progression from chi stagnation all the way to, to uh, blood and phlegm stasis knotted together, or um, uh, bone D in the term in Chinese medicine. Okay. So first of all, after an acute joint sprain like this that, that tears up some of the, the joint uh, tissues, <clears throat> um, there will be some pain inhibition to, to accurate proprioception. Pain will block um, uh, good 
awareness and control of where the joint is in space. The nociceptive signals will override the proprioceptive signals. And so people become more clumsy and actually more prone to yet another joint sprain uh, after an initial joint sprain. Okay. So there's, there's also a loss of ability to resist outside forces. What, do, what outside forces do I mean? Well, the number one is simply gravity um, the, and, and what's called the ground reaction force, which is the, the force of the ground pushing up against our ankle and knee and hip and so on and when we walk. Um, other outside forces might be a blow to the body or something heavy that we're trying to catch or lift. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excessive or abnormal motion starts to take place at that joint. And this is a technical term I used earlier, joint dysfunction. Joint dysfunction means specifically that the motion of the joint is no longer as functional as it's supposed to be. Uh, it's, it may be too much or maybe abnormal or not tracking properly. Um, then we start to get structural displacement and derangement of the joint. Again, that's a technical term, the derangement of the joint um, uh, through, through disruption of its structures. Um, Abnormal and excessive contact of the cartilaginous end plates, uh, and that starts to wear out the cartilage. Uh, we get a loss of blood flow and cartilage and synovial fluid inside the joint. That we, because of the abrasion of those surfaces, we get osteophyte formation or bone spurring. Bone spurs themselves are not necessarily painful, um, but it's what they impinge upon. If they start hitting the periosteum of another bone, or they cut into a ligament or a tendon or a nerve, they can generate a lot of pain. Okay. Um, and then we have the, the, the late stages of this are joint degeneration, osteoarthrosis, degenerative joint disease that are characterized by loss of range of motion, stiffness, crepitus and crunching and grinding in the joint. And the end stage of this is ankylosis. The joint just fuses entirely. There's no cartilage left. There's no synovial fluid left. It's what used to be two bones have grown into one bone. Okay. Um, so the injury to, to the young aspects of the joint, the extra or transarticular tissues, come from overloading, either acute or chronic overloading of muscles and tendons. They can strain them. They can cause trigger point formation. That's what we spent yesterday's class on. Um, and tendonitis and bursitis can arise out of strains to, to the young extra articular tissues. Um, and because they, once they can no longer provide as good dynamic stability of that joint, we also have structural weakness and pain inhibition to use there as well. Loss of dynamic control and stability to, um, to resist outside forces. Uh, repeated sprains, joint dysfunction, disuse deprives the muscles, tendons, and joints of blood flow, uh, poor healing, and the end stage is muscle fibrosis and tendinosis. Um, the, the muscles and tendons become fibrotic and thickened, woody, uh, loss of flexibility, but also loss of strength at the same time, more prone to snapping and tearing. So uh, this slide takes a little moment to, lo to load here. If it doesn't load properly, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. But, that's, but there is, as I mentioned, this degenerative cascade, both Eastern and Western. Um, and since it doesn't look like the graphic is going to load properly for some reason, uh, I'll just uh, describe it verbally. Um, and maybe it's displaying well on your end. The eastern side of this is the progression we're familiar with from um, chi stagnation to blood stagnation to painful obstruction syndrome or B syndrome uh, that can take a, a variety of forms, wind, hold, wind, cold, heat, and damp, but can also be characterized by, by tissue, um, uh, tendon B, muscle B, skin B, um, but the end stage is bone B, also, um, also described as phlegm and blood stasis knotted together. Um, the, the, you know, one way of looking at and understanding bone spurs is really congealed phlegm. Um, <clears throat> the western uh, degenerative cascade goes from acute sprains or joint dysfunction of a chronic sort, say a postural or ergonomic fault, um, a dysfunctional use of the joint, um, and then the next stage being derangement of the joint. It starts to break down and, and get deranged and then degeneration of the joint, tissues atrophy or hypertrophy in various ways that, that uh, we also called uh, osteoarthrosis, and then the final stage being ankylosis, as I mentioned, bone to bone fused. Okay. All right, so, um, oh, here it is. I, I'll just have to click another arrow. So now I can see what I hope you've been seeing all along is this, uh, this degenerative uh, cascade, eastern and western. Okay. So moving on to the next slide. There we go. Okay, I'm 
Oops, I might have skipped over a slide here. Okay. So I'm going to go through here and um, I, uh, a little bit of discussion of the, um, the Jing Jin, the, the, what is translated often as sinew meridians. Um, but I'm going to explain to you why I don't particularly care for that translation. And I'm going to be using the term myofascial tracts in general throughout this class um, because I think that's a better description of what we're really dealing with. Um, I'm not a Ch Chinese language speaker or scholar, um, and so I, I, I'm not representing this as the, you know, that I've, I've done deep research into this, but I am just correlating, you know, what are the modern English, what do these modern English terms mean, and how can we describe effectively what I believe is being communicated through us, to us through the traditional, the classical Chinese texts. Um, so, uh, meridians are, are what they really mean in English outside of the world of, of acupuncture is an imaginary line or semicircle on the Earth's surface um, or representation on a map or a globe. Vessels, a large ship or a boat, a hollow container used to hold liquid or a bowl or a cask. Channels, a length of water uh, wider than a straight joining two areas of water, especially two seas. A band of frequencies used in radio or television transmission. I don't know. That just doesn't. That doesn't. Uh, how about tracks? So here's here's what here, these are definitions of the word tracks um, from contemporary English dictionaries. Major passage in the body, large bundle of nerve fibers or other continuous elongated anatomical structure or region. System of body parts or organs that act together to form some function, uh, like the digestive tract. A bundle of nerve fibers having a common origin, termination, and function. A definite region or area of the body, especially a group, series, or system of related parts or organs. That to me comes much closer to describing what, what uh, I think I'm thinking about when I'm treating muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints are, are tracts. Okay? Um, and sinew uh, is an archaic literary term at this point in the English language, which really just means tendons. Um, but if we look at the, the, uh, the characters that make up uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> the complex ideograph of jin, um, ro meaning flesh, including muscular tissue. Li does mean tendons, and, but also means physical strength and power. And ju, literally, you know, bamboo, uh, a, a series of uh, a jointed chain of segments. Um, sinew doesn't capture that nearly sorry. as well. I I'm sorry. My top. So that's that's Siri talking to me. I apologize. Um, not now, Siri. Um, <laughs> um, a myofascial comes a much better to capture, uh, closer to capturing what's I think being described by the term of gene, which is muscles and connective tissue that link muscles and link bones together to form what we also would call a kinematic chain in, in Western medicine. It's an assembly of rigid bodies connected by joints to provide uh, uh, motion in a particular way and also a pathway uh, along which forces are transmitted. Okay? So I'm going to be using this term um, I'll use the terms Jing Jin when I'm speaking, uh, when I'm trying to describe it in Chinese terminology, and also myofascial tract when I'm describing it in, uh, um, uh, in uh, Western terminology. Okay, so the Jing Jin is kinematic chains. Biomechanical movements, forces, and loads are transmitted from segment to segment along the kinematic chains of the Jing Jin, and the the limb joints are convergences of Jing Jin. So small joints, like the, the finger joints or the toe joints, may involve just one or two uh, jing jing. Um, for example, the thumb uh, interphalangeal joints just involve the taiyang, yang ming jing jing. But the larger joints, the hip, the knee, the shoulder, the ankle, the elbow, involve all six of the jing jing that pass through them. Okay? Um, and what happens in a joint, you can see how it affects a large number of jing jing, which also communicate with the jing luo. Okay? So, um, so, abnormalities of motion at a joint can affect stability and force transmission along the entire Jing Jin and or the kinematic chain and can be propagated longitudinally and also can affect adjacent Jing Jin or kinematic chains. And so we get this vicious cycle of pain inhibiting uh, motion and proprioception leading to disuse and degeneration of the joint. So. Um, uh, one of the things I really want to emphasize, and I'll emphasize it multiple times throughout the day, is the importance of, of thinking in terms of these longitudinal pathways. Right? Um, we could, um, to, to simply focus on one joint at a time is to kind of abandon 
what the wisdom of Chinese medicine uh, for a purely Western orthopedic approach of just saying, oh, this is an ankle problem, I'm just going to treat the ankle. Uh, it, it is the, the norm rather than the exception that a patient who's complaining, for example, of knee problems or hip problems, um, if I examine both legs, I might find that there are, they have hypermobile ankles on the opposite side, for example, or both sides. Um, that is a big factor in affecting their gait. And when I do a little more history, I find, oh, that's what happened first. They actually sprained their ankle really badly, and then it didn't get healed uh, properly. It didn't get proper treatment. And then they started developing hip and knee problems. And then their hip and knee problems may be more symptomatic than the old ankle injury that has kind of cooled off and is no longer inflamed, but it's still clinically really significant. Um, and we can't really get anywhere treating that hip or that knee pain until we stabilize that ankle and normalize their gait. So it's a very important thing to understand is, is to look up and down the, uh, the Jing Jin at all the joints, not just the ones that are screaming loudest, but also the ones that may be silent and hidden contributors. Okay. Um, I think I've actually, I've actually already covered everything, I've already said everything in this slide, so I'm going to skip over it here. And um, so here, here is how joints become hypermobile. Um, one route is through acute trauma, a sprain or an injury, like an ankle sprain or a fracture. Um, Subacute, um, inadequately healed sprains um, or a surgery that didn't have as optimal an outcome as everyone hoped. Um, also out of chronic and insidious um, repetitive overuse or simply deconditioning, muscle weakness or neuropathic pain that inhibits um, the, the functioning of the muscle. And when those muscles are weak and are not firing properly or being overused, um, that can also contribute to joint hypermobility. But most often we're dealing with some kind of acute injury or trauma that began it and then didn't get properly healed. Okay. Joint sprains are very common. Um, ankle sprains are the number one cause of visits to urgent care in the U.S., <clears throat> at least in the pre-COVID era. Let's we'll see what happens here. But, um, but approximately 2 million a year in the U.S. and 20% of all sports injuries in the U.S. are just ankle sprains. Um, perhaps because they're so commonly injured, people, whether they're patients or physicians, tend to shrug them off. And, and uh, very often I'll have this conversation with a patient and I'll say, have you ever sprained your ankle? i say, no, no. And I'll check it and I'll say, well, your ankle is really hypermobile. You sure you've never sprained it? I'll say, oh, well, I've rolled it a few times. Oh, yeah, I've rolled it a dozen times. Oh, I've, you know, 20 times. I don't know. I've lost track. Well, ankles don't normally roll, do they? We're not walking on bowling balls. We're walking on something that's supposed to be quite stable. It is not normal to roll an ankle. It is common, but common is not normal. Okay? So, um, so sometimes it takes a little bit of probing, a little bit of inquiry to get the full history. But luckily, in some sense, we don't even really need it. If we find on physical exam it's a hypermobile ankle, whether or not the patient can remember it, um, I'm going to go ahead and treat it anyway because it, it can be very clinically significant. And, and not un, it's not uncommon for me to do this. And then a week later, I see the patient again. And they say, oh, oh, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, when I was playing high school in basketball, I really sprained my ankle bad. And I had to you know, limp around on a crutches or whatever for a couple of weeks or something. Um, but sometimes people just never remember them, but they may have happened on the playground as a kid, or they may have just shrugged it off, just assuming that it's normal for people to roll their ankles and then forgotten about it. Okay? Um, but a significant acute sprain tends to be immediately disabling and can't be played through by force of will the way a muscle strain might be able to. You know, some you know, athletes can just like, okay, I'm just going to power through this, it hurts can't do that with an unstable joint, a deranged joint. It no longer functions and uh, its biomechanics are disrupted. Um, and so a significant joint sprain can be a major contributor to chronic pain and disability and can end uh, careers and end, end games and end careers for athletes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's some non-joint ligaments that we'll also address today. Uh, these two can get stretched out. They don't necessarily cross a joint, but um, I'll, I'll go through these rather than way through this list verbally, we'll just actually address some of these with, with some of the demonstration patients that we'll see today. But you can refer back to this list here. <clears throat> Joint hypermobility can be a hidden factor in neuropathic pain. Uh, here are some common examples of this. Uh, uh, hypermobile or dysfunctionally moving facet joints in the spine can accelerate the process of uh, stenosis of the neuroforamen. 
uh, uh, closing down of the bony canal out through which our nerve roots exit, and that can start eventually to compress the nerve roots and cause uh, what we call radiculopathies or radicular symptoms, um, numbness, tingling, and pain down a limb. And so sometimes we need to treat the facet joints and get them functioning normally again to, uh, to decompress that nerve. Uh, this is a fairly common presentation. An acromioclavicular joint sprain uh, leads to hypermobility at that AC joint. And now that clavicle is kind of floating around when it should be really stable. And if that collarbone starts to impinge on the brachial plexus or the muscles that surround the collarbone, such as the scalenes, the pec minor, the subclavius, et cetera, um, start to tighten up to try to compensate for that loose AC joint, they may start to irritate and compress the brachial plexus. And then somebody gets what they think is thoracic outlet syndrome. But the problem is really that their AC joint got sprained and didn't heal properly. And so we need to restabilize that AC joint. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, the radiocarpal and ulnocarpal joints in the wrist can get sprained or start to develop bony hypertrophy later on in life after a sprain. And those bones can start to impinge on the median and ulnar nerves. Um, and then another very common presentation is that uh, sprains or dysfunctional motions of the sacroiliac hip, knee, or ankle joints um, can cause compensatory tightening of the, the muscles across the hip joint, including the piriformis. So this may be an underlying hidden cause if you've got a patient with stubborn piriformis compressing the sciatic nerve that's not responding to trigger needling of the sort that I talked about yesterday. You know, I can reduce trigger points all day in the piriformis, but if they have an unstable hip or knee or ankle joint further down that leg, those trigger points are likely going to reform much faster until I treat that, that joint instability that is the hidden cause of why their piriformis is tightening up and compressing the static nerve. Okay. <clears throat> so some of the challenges in working with hypermobile joints is that they have poor blood supply and lymphatic drainage compared to muscles. They have very limited regenerative capacity. They heal slowly and poorly through rest alone. They may not heal at all simply by resting them if they're really badly sprained. And the things that we can do on our own and that patients often do on their own to take care of you know, muscle strains and tendonitis, things like stretching, exercise, heat, and massage. Um, uh, well, heat doesn't worsen joint hypermobility, but those other things do. Um, stretch a hypermobile joint, uh, exercise it in the wrong way, massage it, gua sha it, suction cup it, you can actually make it much worse because you're further tearing and straining these uh, tissues that don't have elastic recoil, um, the, um, the ligaments in the joint capsule. Okay? Um, so there's a lot less that patients can do on their own to heal a joint um, hypermobility problem. They really can't do very much on their own. They can strengthen the muscles that cross the joint, and that's about it. So patients will often ask me with a joint sprain, so what can I do? I say, well, you can't really heal the joint structures, but you can strengthen the, the muscles that cross it, so at least you have a little better control of it, and you're, um, you're better able to use it. Okay? So, um, so the, uh, the, the, the pain and reduced tissue integrity by, by degrading control and stability um, leads to a, a vicious cycle of further joint injuries and degeneration, and it really requires outside intervention to treat this, and acupuncture works great for this. Um, so, how do we know when to reach for this technique? How do we know when we're dealing with a joint injury? Well, acute joint sprains are generally pretty easy. Um, generally, the patient knows themselves. They will describe some kind of a sudden pop or twist or, or um, uh, painful uh, sense of something tearing uh, in, a, um, in a joint that's followed by local pain and redness and heat and swelling and bruising under the, the skin, ecchymosis. Um, and there's a reduced motion. They don't want to use the joint. They don't want to, it's altered in its motion. They don't want to put weight on it, et cetera. And those ones are pretty easy to identify. Um, but we do know how to grade their severity and know when this is a joint that, first of all, needs to be uh, re, you know, the, the dislocation needs to be reduced in the emergency room. Uh, they need emergency surgery to decompress some kind of damaged nerve or vascular pathway that crosses the joint, et cetera. Okay, so we'll talk a little more about that. Um, but we also need to be able to identify on the basis of history and exam when a joint is, is a silent contributor. It's a hypermobile joint that may be a perpetuating factor in chronic pain and disability, even when it's not screaming loudly. Okay. So um, 
some of the uh, the um, history suggestive of acute sprains. I already kind of went through this. It's all fairly obvious, but um, let me just look at my own slide here, see if there's anything I missed. Um, so yeah, so let's let's talk about some of the the symptoms and the history that suggest a more serious joint sprain that we should probably refer out at the same time as we may treat it, but they also do need to be seen promptly by physician care. If there's really significant bruising uh, around the joint, significant ecchymosis, we can't rule out on the basis of our own physical exam in our clinics unless we have an x-ray machine in our office. We need to send them out to make sure that the bruising isn't coming from a bone. Bones have a lot of blood in them, and they bruise um, uh, when, when fractured. Um, in comparison, ligaments and capsules and cartilage actually have very little blood in them. They have some, but they won't bleed as much as a bone does. Of course, the bleeding could also be muscle and tendon, but we can't make that differentiation really definitively without an x-ray machine. I've had nine patients walk into my office swearing that they didn't have a, uh, a fracture in their foot or their ankle after a sprain, and I made them go get an x-ray, and sure enough, they had a fracture. One of those patients was me, actually. I walked it, I, walked into somebody else's office on a fracture, with a couple of fractured toes, sure that I didn't have a fracture, and they pointed out the bruising and said, you need to go get an x-ray. Sure enough, fractures, okay? So just because they can walk on it and because they're stoic about it or in denial about it doesn't mean they don't have it, okay? Um, so if a patient can't bear weight on the joint, though, that, that if they really cannot tolerate weight or it just starts to buckle and give way as soon as they put weight on it, that, too, is a prompt referral to, uh, to emergency care, okay? Um, if they have really severe pain, even when the joint is at rest, it's not necessarily a medical emergency, but that makes me uneasy. Um, they should, there should be some relationship between the mechanical use of the joint and the degree of pain. And if it's really just excruciating pain, even when they're at rest, that too is a situation where I'm generally going to refer the, pain, the patient on to an urgent care setting. Now, this one too is really important. If they've got numbness or tingling or loss of strength or coordination, particularly if there's temperature changes, um, typically, this will be distal to a, a, a severe joint sprain, but might also be proximal. Um, those suggest some kind of significant neurovascular damage. And those are, you need to be over at the emergency room right now because you're probably going to need a surgery to decompress that nerve, stop the bleeding, you know, decompress the artery, whatever it is that's causing this um, um, numbness and tingling downstream from the, uh, from the sprain joint, okay? Um, so those are all red flags for, for urgent care referral. Um, a little trickier to pick up, though, is chronic hypermobility. So here's some of the questions I ask. Of course, have you sprained this joint in the past or any other joint in that limb or the, or the opposite limb, particularly when we're dealing with legs? Not so much an issue for arms, but with, with leg, we always want to ask our questions bilaterally because of the way that we compensate uh, for, you know, during gait uh, for the ground reaction force by shifting to the uninjured leg. Okay. Um, if there's a history of sus sustained or repetitive activity that loads or stretches the joint, for example, somebody whose work or their sports or other activities have them frequently squatting or kneeling or jumping or pivoting, those all really load the knee joint. Racket sports uh, and golf heavily load the, the elbow. Um, uh, bending and lifting, twisting the torso stretches the spinal discs and facets. Yoga stretches everything, and I've had more than one yoga instructor uh, and many yoga students in my practice with problems that come from overstretching the joints. Um, I'm not knocking yoga globally. I go to yoga classes and I really enjoy it, but there are certain poses, for example, pigeon pose, I don't do because I got an old knee injury and I know that if I do pigeon pose, I'm gonna, gonna re-injure my knee, okay? Um, so that's just one example, okay? Um, so, so where should we be asking about? Um, Symptomatic joints, obviously, we want to ask about uh, limb, spinal regions. Um, joints that were reported as previously sprained, even if they're now asymptomatic, we want to examine. Even if the patient says, oh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah, I sprained my ankle, but it feels fine now. We still want to examine it because it may be very hypermobile, um, uh, even though it was sprained a long time ago and it's completely silent and asymptomatic. Joints distally and proximally along the kinematic chain, or the jing jin, even if they're asymptomatic. So, for example, for elbow pain, we should be looking at the wrist and shoulder joints. For knee pain, we should look at the SI, hip, ankle, and midfoot joints. For the spine, um, we just need to look up and down the length of the spine. Okay? And for leg, as I've said before, and this is also true for spine, we need to check the opposite side. The symptomatic side may be compensating for 
silent hypermobility on the contralateral side. Um, this is not needed for the arm so much unless somebody is engaged in a lot of activities where they're weight bearing on both arms. Okay. That's not a whole lot of us. Okay. Um, so I know that seems like an overwhelming and exhaustive list. I don't necessarily do this all in one visit. It, may, it depends. You know, maybe the initial visit I just get to examine one or two of the most symptomatic joints. Follow up. I'll say, okay, let's look at the entire chain, particularly if um, they are um, not uh, responding to the treatment that I, I, uh, I did initially. Um, okay. So, um, so let's talk about these symptoms of chronic hypermobility um, and dysfunctions of motion stability. How might we pick these up? Okay. So they might report that the, 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 the motion is weak or painful or reduced or difficult. That doesn't tell us necessarily it's the joint. It could be just muscles and tendons. It could be other factors and stuff. But that's a little flag saying, okay, if, if they're saying it's painful to use this joint, painful to use this limb, I'm going to check the joints. I'm going to examine the joints. Okay? Um, the patient says that they have to alter their movement in order to avoid pain. That's another flag for examining the joints. Sometimes, but surprisingly not very often, the patient will actually say things like, my joint feels unstable or feels a little loose, or it gives out or gives way or responds unpredictably to loading. Uh, a lot of times they don't say that, and yet it is a hypermobile joint. But if they do say that, I'm definitely going to check that joint. If they report anything about crepitus or catching or clicking or clunking or shifting. Now, my question there is, is it painful? Is that pop you're complaining about, is it a painful pop? If so, yeah, definitely we should check the joint. They may have something like a torn labrum, um, uh, torn capsule. Uh, if it's a painless pop, it's, it's much less significant. It's harder to tell what that is for sure. Um, but still, you know, it's an indication to check the joint. Um, particularly if they say that, that actively moving the joint or somebody else moving the joint for them provokes a sudden sharp twinge of pain. Um, even if it's not a predictable thing, like they get really frustrated. It's like I move my arm. 10 times like this, and it, no problem. And the 11th time I move it, and suddenly I get this sharp, painful catch. Okay? That kind of variability um, suggests that the joint is unstable. Most of the time it tracks OK, but they do something a little bit different, and it, it maltracks. It doesn't track properly, and then suddenly some intraarticular structure uh, gets snagged, gets impinged upon, and causes a little jolt of pain. Okay? Um, the joint might feel kind of a dull achiness at rest that's kind of non-specific and doesn't tell me that much, but that's another thing I listen for. But any of these things indicate possible joint hypermobility. However, I just want I'm going to keep emphasizing this. Chronic joint hypermobility may be asymptomatic and problematic at the same time. And I just can't emphasize that enough because we're so oriented in the West towards anesthetizing our patients, taking away pain. Where's the pain? I'll just chase the pain around, make the pain go away, et cetera. And if we don't um, think structurally and functionally and think about hidden silent contributors, we may just keep chasing it around and get really inadequate results where if we start thinking, even if it's asymptomatic, even if there's no pain, but it's not functioning properly, it's not stable, it's not moving properly, it may be very clinically significant. Okay. So I know I've been going for quite a while nonstop here, um, uh, and uh, there's some questions popping up that I will get to. Um, we have our first patient coming at 10:30, and, and after or 10:45, and we're going to take a break at 10:30, and after that we're going to have quite a series of patients coming through. And a lot of the questions that you're asking uh, in the chat room are questions that I'm going to get to um, in the course of actually demonstrating on patients, which I think really. You know, for me, and I think for most of us, is really the best way to learn, and it leaves the last, most lasting imprint. So, I, I do have the ability to scroll back through the questions you've asked, and I will try to get to them. Um, but just bear with me for a little bit longer here till we get to our break time, and then we'll have some patience, and that's when I'll get to a lot of these questions. Okay. So, um, so yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about the referred pain patterns of of muscles that are very useful to know um, and be familiar with. Joints also refer pain, um, and the, the referred pain patterns of joints are much less uh, are much less well mapped and well researched and studied and understood than the referred pain patterns of uh, of, um, of muscles. But there are a few that are, are worth knowing. Um, but in comparison to the um, to myofascial and neural pain, 
the referred pain of, of chronically hypermobile joints tends to be a lot less burning, a lot less severe. It can be even silent, completely asymptomatic, as I mentioned. It tends to be more kind of dull and achy. Sometimes patients will describe it as feeling almost empty uh, deep inside the joint. It feels like there's a, um, uh, an, it's just kind of analogous to the chi deficiency headache, right? The head feels kind of this dull, empty, aching pain that is not very well localized. Uh, and and that, that's similar to what a, an old chronically hypermobile joint may feel like. It just feels kind of weak and empty and dull achiness. Um, it doesn't feel electrical. It doesn't feel numb. It doesn't feel tight, tingly or tight or crampy or spasmodic. Those are all neuromuscular symptoms, not joint symptoms or vascular symptoms, but not joint. And here's the interesting thing. Yesterday, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but we all know this, that muscles are, are closely linked to emotions, right? Particularly the facial muscles, the upper trapezius. When people are under stress, they express it facially through their muscles and through hiking their shoulders up to their ears like this. Um, joints don't have that intimate relationship with emotions. Um, and so I, I've very, very rarely heard a patient say, um, when I'm really stressed or upset, my elbow joint hurts. My, you know, interphalangeal joint to my fifth finger hurts. Um, I don't think I've ever heard that one. Uh, spine is kind of the exception, um, but it's hard to differentiate when they're talking about, you know, my neck hurts, my back hurts when I'm stressed out. Are they talking about the muscles or the, or the joints of the spine? They're, but, but in terms of the limb joints, they don't really respond to emotional factors one way or the other. Okay. Um, but here are some examples of facet joint referred pain patterns, um, cervical and, uh, and lumbar. Uh, facet joints on the side of the spine can refer pain in these you know, recognizable patterns that have some overlap with you know, disc and nerve patterns as well, but it's just to remind us to not ignore the joints, um, even if they have an MRI that says, oh, this is a, they've got a herniated disc, et cetera. Okay. So this is my big picture summary when and where to examine for joint hypermobility. Um, muscle tendon pain or weakness or bursitis, check the underlying joint. Nerve pain, numbness, or tingling on motion, check the adjacent joints. Um, um, the joint hurts or rest, painful clicks or pops or clunks or feels unstable upon motion, check the symptomatic joint. Always check joints distally and proximally along the affected jing jing. And with the spine and legs, also check the opposite side. Okay, so um, how do we do this? How do we do our physical exam, exam for joint hypermobility? We can look, we can palpate, we can listen, uh, we can watch for subconscious movement abnormalities, we can assess their active range of motion, uh, whether it causes pain or whether it's abnormal, how it tracks. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the, the most important technique here is the passive joint play or Enfield and stability testing, um, which I will go through as much as I can today, but I do want to say that there's a lot of resources on YouTube and out there on the web now, uh, mostly taught by physical therapists, um, maybe some chiropractors and osteopaths that use this as a way of assessing joint stability and function. So there's a lot of other ways to learn this out there. There's also the tenderness, the degree of tenderness of the joint, uh, not terribly reliable, but um, in terms of the uh, the severity of the joint injury necessarily, but can be very useful for determining exactly where to insert the needle in the joint. Uh, strength testing is a sort of supplementary technique for examining a, a hypermobile joint. Um, and then this is a really important thing, is to re-examine the joint after treatment. If we, if we do our history and physical exam properly, we do our proloacupuncture properly, uh, I am looking for essentially an instantaneous response. Um, uh, I pull the needle out, I reassess the joint. If I've done it right, uh, that joint should be more stable right away, instantly, not five minutes later, not ten minutes later. It is an immediate response um, to needling effectively. Um, and if I don't get it, that means either, you know, one of two things. I either didn't get it, I didn't do it right myself, or perhaps that ligament has snapped clean through or so badly degenerated there's hardly anything of it left and not much to work with. But that's the summary of techniques that we use for, for joint for examining for joint hypermobility. Okay. So not all joint injuries are necessarily visible or palpable. 
Um, but here are the things that we would want to look for. Is there a, a normal shape alignment or orientation? If it's um, a really dislocated joint, we're going to see bone where it shouldn't be and no bone where it should be, okay? But sometimes it's, it's often a little subtler than that. Um, but with uh, reference to anatomy uh, texts and, uh, and reference to our prior database of all the patients we've seen, we'll start to recognize those, any kind of abnormal shape or alignment to the joint. Uh, any kind of displacement of the joint relative to adjacent tissue. Any soft tissue swelling, redness heat, or ecchymosis. Um, uh, a bony prominence or hypertrophy, overgrowth of the bone. Um, <clears throat> and then we can palpate superficial ligaments and joint capsules. And sometimes we'll find abnormalities there. That we're, and this takes just some practice and repetition, kind of getting to know with your fingertips what normal is and what abnormal is, just like with pulse. Okay? When you've um, felt a number of um, uh, the, the, what the ligamentous tissue is supposed to feel like around the ankle, um, and then you find an abnormality that's characterized by thinning or flaccidity, uh, the, the ligaments feel kind of you know, very weak and, and thin, and, and um, there's not much structure left there. Or they might feel kind of boggy and swollen and mushy. Uh, they might be tender. Um, so these are some of the, here's a list of uh, superficial joints that are relatively easy to, to, to palpate. Uh, uh, sorry, ligaments. Um, they're relatively easy to palpate. The, actually, the sacred tuberous ligaments is a little deep in there, but it's palpable underneath the gluteals. Um, the supraspinous ligament linking the individual vertebrae together is another example, and there's some others there that I'll skip over for now, but we'll come back to later in the class. Um, we can listen for joint motion um, and observe subconscious movements of gait, of arm elevation, twisting the torso, etc. And what we're looking for is, and we're always comparing one side to the other, the uninjured side versus the injured side. Of course, sometimes they have bilateral injuries, but um, we, we just are always trying to compare looking for wobbles, for variability, for asymmetry, for, for um, limited or excessive range. Okay? Uh, excessive range is not necessarily a good thing, right? Everyone wants to stretch their joints out and have them be loose. There's, too, there's such a thing as too much of a good thing with this. The shoulder joint, in particular, suffers invariably from hypermobility um, until the end stage of osteoarthrosis, which is pretty rare in the shoulder. Usually the problem with the shoulders is way too mobile. Okay? Uh, we're also watching for any, anything that indicates pain avoidance or pain provocation. And then we're listening for crepitus, catching, clicking, and clunking. And then asking, was that painful? They move their knee and, and there's a little crunch or a little click. They say, did that hurt? If it didn't hurt, I'm not going to make that much of it. But if it's, suggest if it's accompanied by pain, that suggests that there is some derangement of the joint. Okay. So while we're inspecting and listening, um, um, we can ask the patient to move their joint through the various planes of anatomical motion. And this only works if we, we isolate the planes of motion. So we do have to know what the normal planes of motion for a given joint are um, and, and what the normal ranges are. And there's lots of online references for this. I didn't build them into this class because they're very easy to find online. Um, but for example, um, in layperson terminology, what did I just do with my arm? I extended it, right? I reached up with my arm. In layperson terminology, that's extension, but in anatomical ter terminology, that's actually flexion, right? Um, if I take it out to the side like this, that's abduction, right? This is horizontal adduction moving across like that. So those are examples of planes of motion that we need to, uh, to ask the patient to move a joint through. Um, but hypermobility can be there even if there's no excessive range. Okay? But when we have excessive range that's unilateral, on one side, you know, they can only get their arm up. I mean, this is maybe their norm on their asymptomatic uninjured side. This is actually, I'm sorry, this is not a great example. The shoulder often tends towards problems of um, the excessive external rotation. So I just externally rotated. This is my hypermobile shoulder. I can get it too far back in external rotation on my side that doesn't have an old injury. Let's see if I can position myself so the camera shows it properly there. I can't get as far back. That's a, this is a, on the left side, I've got a stable shoulder joint here. This is an old shoulder injury. It's a little too hypermobile. This is also my dominant side arm. The dominant side tends to be a little bit more hypermobile than the other side, but it shouldn't be excessively hypermobile and it shouldn't have be symptomatic simply as a result of being dominant side. Okay. 
So here's the here's this most important technique that I'll be demonstrating a lot throughout the day. It's the uh, the end feel or passive stress testing technique. And this too is really, really essential that we isolate um, the plane of motion that we're testing and we have to isolate the joint or the ligament that we're testing. So the basic technique here, um, and I, again, I'll be demonstrating this in person, um, but actually right now, maybe, maybe it would be good, um, tomorrow if you're willing to come over here for just a moment, um, let me ask you to um, maybe take your sweatshirt off and I'm going to give an example of how I examine the chromioclavicular joint, okay? So, so, yeah, so we need to orient this a little bit so that, okay, and I'm going to angle it down like that. So it's really essential that I put one hand quite firmly on her scapula here and keep it from moving. I've got to keep it very stable and um, she's standing right now, but by having her sit, that would keep her torso out of the picture. I want to, to minimize motion anywhere else. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to, going to run my fingers along her clavicle until I get to the end of the clavicle. Um, and then I'm going to put a sensory thumb right here, and my hand here is keeping her, her scapula fixed in place so there's no motion taking place. And then with my other hand, I'm going to push on her clavicle, and I'm going to see, does her clavicle move relative to her scapula? There should be hardly any motion there, hardly any play. It's supposed to be a fairly stable joint, and, 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 I, and I can't... Um, and I can't move it, which is good. It means that that joint is stable. I push on the clavicle, it doesn't go anywhere. I could push your entire body over, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the relative stability of the clavicle versus the acromion. And with my sensory thumb here, I can feel it if the clavicle starts to move right at the AC joint. And I can also feel it out here if there's some play in the clavicle. Now, if she had sprained her acromioclavicular joint, I would push on that clavicle, and it would kind of go back and forth. I could move it around relative to the scapula, okay? So that makes sense to everyone. Um, so when we're doing this, um, we don't do this with a patient who has an acutely sprained joint, and I'll go over that again later, but at least 72 hours or until the acute swelling and bruising has subsided, often I'll wait a couple weeks. Um, first of all, we get false positives or false negatives when we have a lot of swelling and bruising around the area. It's hard to tell what's really going on. Second, we might actually worsen the joint injury a little bit. But this is actually a very gentle technique. You don't need to apply an enormous amount of force if you know what you're looking for and, you, and you're feeling carefully. Um, so, but, but generally, we should start slowly and back off if the patient reports pain. And then we want to know, is the pain from grasping the soft tissue? For example, when I'm examining the knee joint, I have to grasp the gastrocnemius quite firmly in order to move the tibia. But I'm not really interested in how the gastroc feels. I'm interested in what's happening in the knee joint. Okay? So I can kind of ignore complaints about my finger pressure on the soft tissue. What I'm really looking for is, now if it, <clears throat> if it hurts from moving the bone, that's different. Okay? That suggests a more significant joint derangement. But if there's no pain, I can just progress to progressively firmer thrusts until I either find some hypermobility or I'm thrust, thrusting quite firmly and, and I'm comfortable saying, okay, there's no, there's no excessive mobility here, this joint is stable, okay? So we really have to pay attention to the end feel, and the abnormalities um, in end feel are the most significant and most specific finding that tell us that we have a problem or that we don't here, okay? And we'll go through what those abnormal end feels are like. And I just want to emphasize, again, this is a skill like pulse taking, and um, having worked with many generations of students who initially feel a little overwhelmed by this, well, we all felt like that, didn't we, for day one or week one or year one or decade, in my case, decade one with decade two with pulse taking. Pulse taking still I find very, very difficult to, uh, to, to feel confident. Um, but that's also because early on I started orienting towards orthopedic medicine and learning, focusing on physical exam skills, and I haven't really focused on the kinds of internal and psychiatric medicine nearly as much that requires, and, and herbalism that requires really subtle pulse taking. Okay. Um, but if I did, you know, I would get there, right? And you, and you can get there too. I'm, I'm guessing that all of you who signed up for this webinar have some interest in treating musculoskeletal pain and some background in orthopedics. So if you don't already do this technique, this is a very useful technique to start adding to your repertoire. Okay? And it just takes time and repetition and practice. And I've watched multiple generations of students start to master this and become more and more confident and more and more accurate and perceptive in their 
joint play testing, so it can be done. Okay. So here's what we're looking and feeling for: abnormal end feel. Uh, typically, a hypermobile joint will feel mushy and soft. There will be no elastic rebound. Uh, there are some other ab abnormal end feels we'll talk about, but that's the main one we're looking for: is a hypermobile joint. It's going to feel soft. It's going to feel mushy. A tight, stable joint. There's going to be a lot of pushback, a lot of elastic rebound. It's going to feel very firm and tight, like taut, thick rubber bands are holding it together, not sort of loose, stretched out, old, decayed rubber bands. Okay. We're also listening for anything, any clicks or clunks or crepitus, uh, any shifts, and and then you know if they're painful, they're significant. If they're not so painful, not so significant. But uh, pain suggests that there's an acute sprain in the joint or some kind of inflammation in the joint or a tear in the joint. Um, we're also comparing the, the range. How far can I push this joint? The AC joint shouldn't be able to push it at all. Okay, but other joints like the shoulder, uh, the glenohumeral joint or the, um, the ankle joint where there's supposed to be some mobility, I'm going to compare left and right sides. I'm going to compare injured to uninjured side. Where if both sides are injured, I'm going to compare it to my my experiential database of all the other ankles and shoulders that I've, uh, I've checked with. Okay? Um, and then also, finally, in some cases, we're going to check for non-anatomical motions. And there'll be some good examples of this in the knee and in the ankle. There should be no plane at all in this motion pulling the foot forward on the tibia and fibula. But this patient has really badly sprained their anterior talofibular ligament. Now I can slide their entire foot forward by several millimeters versus their tibia and their fibula. That's not normal. Okay. So um, see, I'm just going to scroll through a couple slides quickly to see where I'm at here and then decide where I want to. Okay. So I'm going to go through a couple more slides and then I'll leave one up over. Uh, I'm going to leave this one up over break time for you to look at uh, if you want about some of the abnormal end fields. Okay. So here's some helpful hints to avoid common beginner errors. First of all, you really have to direct your E, your intention or your sensory awareness to how the bones move. Ignoring the adjacent soft tissue for now, um, and you can assure the patient that you care about their soft tissue and you understand that their gastroc is really tender, but right now what you're assessing is how their bones move, not muscle tenderness. Okay? Um, so you, so you're, temporarily you're going to ignore compa patient complaints about tenderness from grasping the adjacent soft tissue, and you're going to direct your E, your intention, on how the bones move. Um, second, just incorporate this kind of joint stability testing. If, if you learn it and practice it, you can do it very rapidly. Um, I can examine multiple joints in less than five minutes um, and just incorporate it into your clinical flow as a routine screening. Then you'll build your experiential database, just like with pulse, right? Um, if you just make it an everyday practice, then you'll get a very sensitive, accurate, database and you'll be very rapid in testing your joint stability for each plane of motion. You're like, okay, I, having tested you know, 200 other ankles, I can tell this one is hypermobile. Okay? Um, and then I think I just already went over this. Just caution of acute sprains. Wait at least 72 hours and until acute pain or swelling has subsided. Uh, often I'll wait a couple weeks, really. And use very gentle pressure on the first trial. Back off on any report of pain. Uh, if you provoke more severe pain or numbness or tingling, you've got a problem that should be referred over to urgent care. And then when they've, you know, come back, you know, a couple weeks later or after having seen urgent care, you just try again. Okay. Um, I already discussed those problems with premature uh, joint testing. And okay, so I'm going to scroll backwards here now to the uh, the normal versus abnormal end field chart. And you can look at that if you like on your break time. But I'm going to uh, now take a 15-minute break. And we have our first demonstration patient. And we're going to be getting her ready um, to go. And so when we come back in, we're going to go right to, uh, to demonstration time. Okay? And we'll, uh, we'll return at, uh, uh, let's say, 1045. Okay? Thank you all very much for your attention.